If you're a wrestling fan of a certain age or from a certain part of the country, few individuals are as synonymous with the sport than the American dream, Dusty Rhodes. He was the common man made king, a symbol of virtue and wrestling justice that fans love to rally behind. While Ric Flair may have been the man in his own right, Dusty was his antithesis, his polar opposite in about every respect. But man, could he hold a crowd in the palm of his hand like nobody's business. Depending on who you talk to, Big Dust was practically the closest crowds would get to seeing the face of God himself. He was that popular. Not only was Rhodes the Crockett's top babyface during the 80s, he was also its leading creative force. When he was the head booker from 1984 to 1989, he led JCP to a brief period of greatness, helping it go from a regional promotion to a national powerhouse, the only company left on the map that had a hope of competing with Vincent Mann's WWF. However, things changed drastically for Dusty in late 88. Jim Crockett's astronomical spending to keep up with its rival to the north, along with Vince frequently sabotaging JCP in the pay-per-view realm, led to the company being sold to Ted Turner. The new corporate leaders declared that no more bloodshed would be allowed on their wrestling shows, to which Rhodes responded by immediately bucking that rule. He booked an angle where the Road Warriors turned heel and stabbed him in the eye with one of their shoulder pad spikes, causing Dusty to be removed as head booker. And soon after after that, he resigned from his wrestler position as well. After spending a few months helping get a regional Florida promotion off the ground, the unthinkable happened. Dusty Rhodes signed with the WWF. It was a different time and a much different company than it was in the late 70s and early 80s, back when Vince Sr. ran things and Rhodes showed up occasionally in his big glittery hat. After Vince Jr. took over the family business, the WWF's MO was to buy the other territories out or just cripple them to the point of insolvency by poaching their top guys. McMahon's attempts to stifle Dusty and the Crockett's were pretty transparent even back then, so Rhodes' signing was akin to him sleeping with the enemy. And oh yeah, that's not even taking into account all the times the company was taking shots at the guy before he was there. For years, one of the Federation's most common tropes was to poke fun at Dusty Rhodes. They named Ted DiBiase's manservant Virgil, which was Dusty's real name. They turned the one-man gang into Akeem the African Dream and had him speak in a similar cadence to the common man. Dusty himself had been a subtle yet recurring punching bag for the WWF, and now he was with them. And now that Dusty was on the WWF's team, the company was sure to treat him with the respect and reverence that comes with being one of the most beloved wrestlers in the country. All right, all right, listen, I can hear you laughing through the screen when I pitched that idea. Truth be told, the idea of the company doing that for him seemed ludicrous even when I said it. I didn't even believe it. But either way, let's look at Dusty Rhodes' time in the WWF. In anticipation of Dusty's big debut, the company spent weeks in the summer of 89 pumping out vignette after vignette of how Dusty embodied the American dream, how he was truly the common man, and they put him to work. He was the owner of a taco shop where your meal was ready in literal seconds. One enchilada coming up. He worked as a pizza delivery man, serving up sardine, oyster, and pig's feet pies. Man, what the hell's going on with that lady's stomach? A little extra snout on the side. Yes. Woohoo! Oh, there favorite. you go, darling. He even carried on the family business as the son of a plumber. I did the first ever triple potty bypass. He shoveled horse crap. He picked up garbage. He was the most charming gas station attendant on the block. He even spent time as a butcher. You cannot beat my prices, but you sure can't beat my meat. Former world champion Dusty Rhodes, everyone. Wrestling's a funny business sometimes. A wrestling star has to be larger than life, but at the same time, in many cases, they also have to be super relatable. It's a really tricky tightrope to walk, but Dusty was generally able to do that for most of his career. These vignettes were supposedly meant to make him seem more relatable, and they were certainly funny, but they didn't exactly make him look dignified. The truth is, most wrestling fans didn't need this much introduction for someone as well-known at the time as Dusty, and the Federation clearly knew this based on the same cheeky ending every skit had. Hey, aren't you? Hey, aren't you? Hey, ain't you? For every Dusty Freeze frame, I lose a little bit of my sanity. The company completed the image overhaul by decking Dusty head to toe in black with yellow polka dots, a design that has since gone down in infamy as one of wrestling's worst ever makeovers. For decades, both fans and wrestlers alike have considered the look an insult, a slap in the face to Dusty that was meant to humiliate him. To this day, many of Dusty's own colleagues consider it a dark stain on his career. It was like Vince slapping Dusty in the face. If I had Dusty, I would have never done that.
Now, dyeing your hair jet black and dressing up like Elvis so you can team with the Honky Tonk Man? A-okay for Greg. To follow Dusty Rhodes' career is an exercise in how much your eyes can withstand one man's insane fashion choices. Dusty and ridiculous outfits went hand in hand, some way more outlandish than polka dots, yet he always had the confidence and charisma to pull it off. What were some yellow dots to the guy with the aforementioned big glittery hat? I sort of agree with the Bruce Pritchard side of things here. It doesn't make sense to spend all this time and effort and money building up this new acquisition with the explicit intent of burying him. But I get why people would cry malice since you only need to look at WWE's greater pattern of doing this exact sort of thing with talent over the years, especially when it came to outsiders. And come on, polka dots have been a universal punchline forever and a day. Who are they fooling? Perhaps Dusty's association with the polka dots is only looked back at somewhat positively today because the dream refused to let the joke be on him. He absolutely embraced the Federation's exaggerated new presentation of him, feeling that it was all a big test from Vince McMahon. He put so much of his energy into it, it didn't matter what he was wearing. If the fans were laughing, it was with him, not at him. It didn't take long or much effort, but Dusty was getting this new gimmick over right away. Dusty made his first live appearance not in a match or even with a promo, but by showing up and stealing the big boss man's stuff after a match. It's going to get down! Take a look at this, Jack! He's just a common man, jacking shit from the cops. But okay, now I'm just confused. I get the polka dots, but now he's got that going on, or a tie-dye shirt at times, and a police officer's hat? You get the polka dots? <laughs> Alright, man. Whatever you say, brother. <laughs> the boss man was a frequent opponent for much of Dusty's time in the Federation, both on TV and on the house show loop. It's kind of fitting considering the boss man was once Big Bubba Rogers, one of the Dream's pet projects back in their old place of work. Rhodes was starting issues with all sorts of men, not just of the big boss variety, but the honky tonk as well. Naturally, the first major conflict between the dream and honky would be under the auspices of a sing-off, a competition inside the WWF studio in which no winner was decided, just showing off two guys who really couldn't sing. We down in Louisiana, close to New Orleans, way back up in the woods among the Ever. Where's the roadie when you need him? Then came their match at SummerSlam. Dusty beat the greatest intercontinental champion of all time until September 8th, 2023, after Jimmy Hart el kabonged the wrong man. Soon after this, Big Dust went back to fighting the boss man and did so for much of the rest of that year. The two men led their respective teams to war at the 89 Survivor Series. That show's opening match saw Dusty, Brutus Beefcake, Tito Santana, and the Red Rooster, or what happens to a Crockett talent when they can't overcome their crappy gimmick, Battle the Boss Man, the Honky Tonk Man, the Model Man, and the Judo Man. The Dream Team came out on top with Dusty pinning Bubba, only for Dusty to take a terrible beating after the bell. Their match at Saturday night's main event later that month saw the big blow-off to their feud, as well as the beginning of a new wrinkle in Dusty's character. Throughout the late fall, an enthusiastic Dusty superfan was often seen in the front row. When Boss Man and Slick began accosting that fan following their loss, Dusty saved the day, invited her to dance in the ring with him, and boom, a love story for the ages. Dusty Rose and Thweet Thatha. When you think of all the wrestlers over the decades who debuted as members of the audience, do you think it gives actual fans unrealistic expectations of what to see when they get there? Who knows, maybe you'll be the next superstar. In reality, Sapphire was Juanita Wright, a former lady wrestler known in the Kansas City area who was cast as Dusty's sweet lady. And apparently it was not Dusty's first choice. My choice was a, a Afro-American hooker off the street <laughs> kind of like Sherry, but kick your ass, you know, right. my man type deal. <laughs> well, can't win them all, I guess. Once again, Dusty made the pairing work, fully committing to the bit, and the tandem was over like Rover. At the 1990 Royal Rumble, both Sapphire and Sensational Queen Sherry were scheduled as guests on the Brother Love Show. Now, why on earth would the person responsible for scheduling the guests for this talk show put two diametrically opposed personalities in the same interview block together unless they wanted them to start a feud? You know, the more I think about it, the more I realize this whole wrestling thing's not really on the up and up. The segment went as well as expected. Brother Love and Sister Queen spent several minutes insulting Sapphire to her face until she'd finally had enough. The macho King Randy Savage got involved, which then prompted the dream to make the save, kicking off the most prominent feud of Dusty's time in the company. 
The two pairs met in WrestleMania's first ever mixed tag team match later that April in Toronto. Rumor has it that Savage was put in this match to prevent him from stealing the show from the Hogan Warrior main event, similar to what he and Ricky Steamboat had done three years earlier. If that was the intention, then the WWF certainly succeeded, but while the match may have been unrefined, it was still highly entertaining, as Savage and Sherry bumped around like cartoon characters for the baby faces before Sherry dropped the ball to Sapphire with some help from a returning Elizabeth. The feud lingered for months, with the Dream and his lady earning more victories against the Macho Monarchy, though something sinister was slowly taking place. A secret admirer began to shower Sapphire with lavish gifts, including a mink coat, a Cadillac, jewelry, and a trip around the world. The mystery concluded at SummerSlam 90. Sapphire no-showed her one-on-one -on -one match with Sherry, forfeiting the match to the Queen. Throughout the rest of the night, viewers received constant updates from Dusty, who was looking everywhere for his missing manager. Hey, Hacksaw, have you seen Sapphire, baby? No, no, I haven't, Dust. Finally forced to head to the ring for his match with the Macho King, the match was interrupted by the sound of Ted DiBiase's laughter. You guessed it, Papa Ted bribed Sapphire to skip out on the match and leave poor Dusty. Feast your eyes on my latest purchase, the sweet Sapphire. Oh, no. <laughs> hmm. Remember a couple years earlier when Ted tried to buy Hercules from the Bobby Heenan family? Well, here they tried the whole human beings as property angle again, only this time way worse. Having the black man servants bad enough, but to loudly declare you have purchased another black person? Come on! You know, it's often been said that the million dollar man was a gimmick that Vincent Mann would have given himself if he were a wrestler. And boy, doesn't the storyline of the rich asshole showering a woman with gifts to keep her complicit ring just a little bit differently in 2024? The sudden yet inevitable betrayal crushed Big Dust, who lost to Savage moments later. Sapphire hopped into a big limo on her way out of the building and was never seen again. And look what she's doing for me now. She's ironing the very money I used to humiliate you. Dusty continued his feud with the MDM, the pinnacle of class warfare. While that was happening, suddenly a young Dustin Rhodes was seen sitting at ringside for his father's matches. Is Dusty just going to get all of his allies from the crowd or what? On an episode of Saturday Night's Main Event, DiBiase and Virgil worked their way through the crowd, paying fans to vacate their seats. When Dustin refused, he was beaten bloody by the pair as Randy Savage held Dusty at bay in the ring. Much like with Bossman the previous year, the rivalry led to a four-on-four -four Survivor Series matchup, with both men leading their respective teams. Though let's call it like it is, the Dusty DiBiase feud is not what fans remember about this match. From Death Valley! The grim visage of the debuting Undertaker was an omen for the future of Dusty's run in the company. He spent the next several weeks putting over DiBiase, Sergeant Slaughter, and even Virgil on house shows before he and Dustin teamed up to take on Ted and Verge at the 19th 1991 Royal Rumble. But again, Dusty and his problems with DiBiase were not the focus of this matchup. It was all window dressing for the much larger moment of DiBiase and his lackey who had finally had enough. Oh, R.I.P. Yeah! Yeah! Virgil. The 91 Rumble would be Dusty's final moment as a full-time in-ring competitor. His days in the WWF were over, and he accepted an offer to return to WCW as the booker, provided he didn't wrestle at the same time. Dusty stayed with WCW until the bitter end in various roles. His last storyline there had him once again teaming with Dustin and battling the duo of Ric Flair and Jeff Jarrett. In fact, the final moments of the penultimate Nitro saw Dusty shove Flair face first into his own ass. Donkey that is. After WCW's demise, he made some appearances on the independent scene. He opened up his own indie and turnbuckle championship wrestling in Florida and even booked for TNA before he was rehired by WWE in 2005 as a creative consultant. He got a DVD set, made some appearances on TV with other legends, and was ultimately inducted into their Hall of Fame in 2007 by his sons Dustin and Cody. He would wrestle his final WWE match that same year, fighting and losing to Randy Orton in a bull rope match at the Great American Bash, one of the many shows Dusty himself conceptualized. He got one more run, so to speak, in the fall of 2013 when he and his sons battled the authority. Dusty's major highlight, aside from telling Stephanie to talk to the hand mid-promo and getting tons of heat for it, was him being in the corner of Cody and Goldust as they fought the Shield at Battleground. He even delivered one final bionic elbow to Dean Ambrose, a lovely punctuation to a storied career.
And of course, Dusty's profound impact on WWE's developmental system in his final years is well documented. Much like how he influenced wrestling in the 1980s with his brand of storytelling, his wisdom helped shape the careers of many of today's biggest stars. Dusty Rhodes passed away in 2015, his legacy secure in the hands of the biggest wrestling company in the world. Much like Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior, Dusty has become deified within the company culture. Those who worked closely with him in the company speak of him in the utmost reverent tones, and there have been tributes to him everywhere you look on WWE programming. Needless to say, it's a far cry from how the company used to portray him. It's easy to allege that Dusty wasn't treated well by WWE in his first big run, but is that really the case? I mean, yeah, the polka dots looked stupid, but they could have given him something a whole lot worse. And if they really hated Dusty that bad, they could have just not employed him and kept making snide references to him on TV. Not only did the fans love him regardless of what he wore, he was a constant presence on television and on the house show loops in 89 and 90 and won a ton more matches than he ever lost. Way to bury the poor guy, am I right? That isn't to say that the polka dots and the common man gimmick were a great way to present a main eventer from another company. If there were anybody else in the outfit, the look would have been a kiss of death and not some quirky thing he had to overcome. I don't doubt that Vince McMahon wanted to mess with Dusty by putting him in that ridiculous getup, and I don't think he would have been broken hearted had Dusty failed to get it over. But I also don't believe that every single booking decision about Dusty's run was meant to poke fun at him. I mean, if you think hard enough, I'm sure you can trace back any bad creative decision about anyone back to Dusty. But in classic dream fashion, he stuck it to Vince by sticking to what brought him to the dance, winning the fans over with his intangible charisma and turning all the doubters into true believers. But what did you think about Dusty's time in the WWF? What were some of your favorite moments of his? Let me know in the comment section below. Be sure to give the video a thumbs up if you like it, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, hit that bell icon for all the notifications. Indeed, Dusty's story in WWE does have a happy ending. But as we all know, wrestling has more than one royal family member with a story of his own to tell and possibly finish Cody Rhodes in two weeks.